Well, today, as, as you've already seen, we're very excited that we've officially now welcomed Baxter Colburn into the, into the fold. And before Baxter started with us here at Lakeside, he worked uh, with an internet company. And it's not the company that I'm about to tell you about. But I spent three hours of my day on Friday with my internet company. And we'll call them Vectrum, okay? That's just what we'll call them, all right? Just, just randomly making up that name. Well, before Brooklyn and I moved into our new house a few months ago, I put in a new customer order under Brooklyn's name so that we would be extended the promo rate for 12 months because the previous internet was in my name. Well, when I did this on Vectrum Services, they said, call us at this 800 number, and so I did. And I spoke with a very friendly fellow down in Texas. And he said, there's no need to start a new account. That's just a lot of paperwork. We'll extend to you the same deal as what you have for 12 additional months. It will be no problem. And I, like a fool, listened to him. And I took the customer service representative from Vectrum's word for it. And so I said, we won't have a problem. And then I got the first bill. And they billed me twice. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And so I called in, and they said, well, sir, you continued service for two days at the previous address. And I said, but your representative told me to. And so that was a whole little kerfuffle that we've managed to work out. And everybody's fine and dandy, and we all held hands and sang kumbaya over the phone, I'm sure. And they eventually saw things my way, which was great, which was great. And now I got my most recent bill on Friday. And they jacked my rate up by $27. And I'm like, no, that's not right. And so I called in, and they're like, well, sir, your promotional period was only good for a year. And I'm like, well, sir, the person I talked to from your representative, from your company, told me it would be 12 additional months. Oh, I see what happened. Let me transfer you to another department. And boy, if they don't find just the worst hold music to make you even more enraged. It's like a game to them. Game on, buddy. You don't know who you're dealing with. That's fine. It's fine. Let's play. You want to play? I'll play. Let's play. And so I talked to the, I talked to the customer retention department. Here's the problem. They have all these monopolies. And so if you want decent internet service in my area, you have to go with Vectrum. There's nowhere else you can go with. And so I'm like, well, okay. And they're like, well, sir, we don't, we don't have this... In the, in the call, but what we'll do for you is this. And so they offer me a rate that's $15 cheaper than what I'm paying. And you can hear the enthusiasm in their voice. Like they're just getting ready to hang up on the call, ding the bell, get entered in the lottery to win a quilt. Like they've saved another customer, all right? They're really excited. And they're like, will that work for you? And I said, no, it won't. I said, why? I said, I want what you honor. I, I want you to honor what you promised me. Well, sir, we don't have any record of that. And I said, How, what, what's your word worth? It's your representative. What's your word worth? And there was just silence on the phone. And they said, well, we'll transfer you to our supervisor. I'm like, great. At this point, why not? So I kick my feet up on my desk at home, and I just wait for a little longer. And by this point in time, I'm doing a little Elaine Bennis dance from Seinfeld in my office chair while I listen to the horrible office music because... It's terrible, but hey, what are you going to do about it, right? So I'll wait. That's fine. And then they come back on the phone and say, the supervisor is too busy to talk to you. That's fine. That's fine. I pull up a new window, and I am starting to type out my complaint to the Better Business Bureau while I'm still talking to the phone representative. Three phone calls from corporate later... Three phone calls from corporate later on Friday night. Vectrum tomorrow is pulling my phone call from July with the representative. I've asked them to forward me the recording. They have refused. I've asked for it. They said no. But we are going to finish this tomorrow because three hours of my life isn't enough. I told the final representative on Friday evening, you know, it really shouldn't be this difficult. It really shouldn't be this hard. You should, number one, value your customers. And number two, if somebody from your, if, if somebody from your organization makes a promise, you should honor it. 
That's all I'm asking. It really shouldn't be this difficult. But if you've ever had the misfortune of dealing with anybody in the internet or the cable game, you understand that more often than not, it's way more complicated than it needs to be. And it is a struggle. And all of us in life experience struggles. And sometimes it's things that at the end of the day, they don't matter that much. At the end of the day, sometimes it's cable and it's internet. But sometimes we experience struggles and difficulties that shake us to the core. And there are things that we can barely overcome. And so this morning, as we continue our look at life, we're going to be looking at what happens when things don't go according to plan. What happens when our lives, when we experience struggles, when we experience hardship, what do we do when our lives don't go according to plan? Thanks so much for being here. In week one of life, we saw that if we follow Jesus, we have nothing to fear. We can walk through life and we can face death with absolutely nothing to fear whatsoever. And then we saw that every single life matters, that every life has value. And last week we saw that we need to guard what we pursue. We need to guard our pursuits. And today we're going to look at struggles. And we're going to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to start in chapter 1. If you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 4. But I'm just going to let you know what's going on when we jump into the story. 1 Samuel 1 tells us of a man named Elkanah. Now, Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina, who was the mother of his children. So Elkanah was married to Hannah, who had no kids, and Penina, who was the mother of his children. He was a religious man who regularly worshipped God. And now we're going to launch into the story in 1 Samuel 1, 4, where we read these words. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. Now, we understand that this is a peace or a fellowship offering, and if you want to dive deeper, you can look up Leviticus 7, 11 through 18 on your own time this week, and you can see what the peace or the fellowship offering was all about. But basically, it was this, to celebrate the relationship that the people had with God. That was what this offering was about. It was a celebratory thing. It was a time of praise. They were thankful for the relationship that they had with God, and that's what Elkanah is doing here. And so after he sacrifices, he gives portion to his wife, Penina, and he gives portions to his kids as well. But verse 5 tells us this. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. So here's Elkanah. He has two wives, and he loves one more than the other. Listen, there will always be problems when there's a side piece involved. There will always be problems when there's a side piece involved. And some of you might think, well, I can manage this, or I I can do it all. I'm telling you this. Do not kid yourself. Do not fool yourself. There will always be problems. There will always be problems. And polygamy was more accepted then, certainly in that culture, than it is in our culture. But that doesn't mean that it's any easier for the people involved in the relationships. And so here's a man. He has multiple wives, and he's torn. He's torn because he loves one more than he loves the other. And now his conduct, he shows that he loves one more than the other. And then you throw in the whole dynamic that the one he loves more isn't the mother to his children. This is just a messed up family situation. And some of you, unfortunately, can relate. Because you're the product of a messed up family situation. Or right now, you're walking through a messed up family situation. Or hopefully not, but some of you might right, might right now be going through a situation where there is someone on the side. And you might be convincing yourself, well, it's just, a, it's just a friendship. It's nothing physical. But it's become an emotional affair. And never make the mistake. There will always be issues when there's someone on the side. 
And you may think that you have it all aligned and everything's working well and everything's going smoothly, but I promise you this, you are on a road to disaster. And so I'm begging you, stop. I'm begging you, stop and turn around. And that means for some people, you may need to go home and you may need to fire off a Facebook message or you may need to send an email. You may need to just let people know, we're done. We're, we're, not, we're not talking anymore. This is the boundary and we're going to honor this boundary. But I promise you, if you go down this direction, you are inviting trouble into your life and it may feel good because it makes you feel young or it makes you feel desirable or it makes you feel wanted or he or she makes you feel like what your spouse used to make you feel like but doesn't make you feel like anymore and so it's like it's a jolt of confidence you are inviting disaster upon yourself slam on the brakes today and turn around because it's not going to end well i promise you that so here's the situation. We have Elkanah. He's married to Peninnah, who's the mother of the children. He's also married to Hannah, who he loves more. He gives Hannah more favor. He gives Hannah more things because he loves her more. But Peninnah has had kids, which especially in this culture is a really big deal. And Hannah has not been able to have children. And verse 6 tells us this. And her, and Hannah's rival, used to provoke her grievously, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Jesus, we see the dysfunction Layer after layer, it just is, it gets more and more messed up. And Penina taunts Hannah because Hannah's unable to bear children. And there's this rivalry. And let me just say practically, this is the problem with this mindset of the future is female, okay? It's, it's right here on display. This is the problem that we see when it's like, oh, well, if, if men would just get out of the picture, everything would be great. That's not the case. That's not the case. And if you've ever worked in an office full of women, you understand already what you're signing up for. That is the cattiest place you will ever walk in in your entire life. Good luck, all right? So the problem is we can't just completely remove a gender because some people have been guilty of things and some people have failed at things. And does that mean that every man is, is treated a woman honorably and with respect? Absolutely not. Should they? Absolutely. Is the answer just to say, well, screw them. The answer is the future is female. No, you are inviting trouble upon yourself. I promise you. Let's make sure that we judge people by the conduct of their character and not their gender or certainly not their race or anything else. But this is the problem. I'm telling you, this is the problem. And as we look, there is an assault on masculinity. I'm t and, and as we look at it, I promise you this. You get rid of masculinity. You get rid of males in leadership. The problems aren't going anywhere. They're going to be a different kind. But the problem is matters of the heart, and that resides in both men and women, and we see it on display here. In recent years, it's been a positive thing that bullying has had an, inc an increased spotlight shown on it. And that's exactly what we have here. And it impacts Hannah. It cuts her to her core. To the place that it talks about, that she, she's, she's, she's destroyed, she's crying, she wouldn't eat. Now, we, we're not sure this could be that it's escalated to the point of an eating disorder. This could be just it's, it's at the point where you're so upset after a traumatic experience that you just don't eat. But whatever the case may be, here we find someone in a toxic situation, in, in just a, a situation that's incredibly painful, that's difficult to navigate. And she's being bullied, she's being taunted by the other wife because she can't produce children. And as we've already said, in that society, 
the inability to have kids was devastating. And so here she is, in a divided marriage, with nowhere to escape from her rival who's constantly telling her she's not good enough, she doesn't measure up, she's not worthy. And compounding all this is her own desire to have children. And she's a wreck. Rightfully so. Verse 8 continues. In Elkanah, her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? He says, Aren't I enough for you? Aren't, aren't I enough? And we just see it on display here. There are just sometimes men just don't get it. They, he means well. He's trying. He's trying to comfort her. But guys, listen. Sometimes, sometimes when when your wife or the woman that you love in your life is, is really upset and she's crying, sometimes she just needs a good cry. And the last thing that's going to help is you trying to interject. And you may think like, ah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to help and I'm going to point out her blessing. I'm going to point out the fact that she's blessed to have me in her life. And I'm going to point out to her like, I'm worth more than 10 kids. What's wrong? You've got me, baby. You're living the dream. It doesn't get better. Like, maybe if she was married to me, okay. But the fact that she's married to, that's a joke, everybody. She's married to Elkanah, all right? Oh, it's a different companionship and affection of a spouse. Is, it's completely different, and thank God for that. But, but God has, has given women this incredible, incredible gift. To love deeper and in more ways than than he's given most men. Not all, but most. And it's just, it's it's a different complexity and it's a different layer altogether. And so he's throwing out this comparison. Well, you got me, baby. And she's saying, no. It's not the same. And maybe some of you have been there. Where there is a deep longing desire in your heart to have kids. And for whatever reason, you've been unable. And unless you've been there, you don't know the nights. But you can't sleep. And the nights that the tears won't stop. You don't know the hurt that's there, that just the, the feeling that you can't fully, you can't even fully put into words. Unless you've been there, you don't know the frustration of the husband as he desperately, desperately loves his wife and he sees her so upset in this longing in her life that's going unfulfilled, in the feelings of hopelessness and helplessness that he has, and he would make it better if he could, and he wants to fix it. He desperately wants to fix it, but there's just nothing he can do, and so he's trying his best, but when he tries his best, he just says things that just don't make it any better. Unless you've been there, you don't know the hurt. Another failed test. Another failed procedure. More bad news from doctors. And that's where Hannah is. Walking through the struggle of infertility. All the while, living with a daily reminder that her husband has kids with his other wife who points out her struggle repeatedly to Hannah. 
Verse 9 says, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, <clears throat> Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. we got to move, but basically there's no rest for Hannah. She prays to God, but still she weeps. She prays, but still she weeps. Understand this. Following God doesn't mean life is easy. Following God doesn't mean everything will work out just the way we want it to. Following God is not a fairy tale. You can follow God and have prayers that go unanswered. You can follow God and experience hurt deeper than you can ever fathom. You can follow God and have things that you desperately long for go unfulfilled. And then it continues. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give to him, to the Lord, all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. She's saying, God, if you hear me, this is my promise. This is what I will do. And verse 12 says, As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Eli thinks she's wasted. She's gone to the temple. She's doing business with God. She is torn. She is torn. And she is praying, but she's praying in her heart. And her lips are moving. If you've ever driven up next to somebody and they've got their windows up in their car and they're just rocking out, you look over and they look absolutely crazy. They're singing to their heart's content, but you can't hear anything. And here she is. She is praying to her heart's content, but she's just mouthing the words. And Eli the priest is like, wow, had a little too much wine. She's drunk. It's like, put down the bottle, lady. Stop. The priest. This is is what he concludes. Listen. Never be concerned with what other people think about you when you're engaging God. Never be concerned with what other people think about you when you're engaging God. They don't know the story. They don't have all the context. They don't see what God sees. He, Eli doesn't know the turmoil. Eli doesn't know what, what Hannah's experiencing. And verse 15 tells us, But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out my great anxiety and vexation. It's like, I'm not wasted. I'm just seeking God. This is what's going on. And might I suggest that when we face anxiety, when we face suffering, when we face obstacles that are too big for us to handle, there is no better response than the response of Hannah. When we arrive at something that is bigger than us, and we will, we have a choice. We can walk through it alone, holding on to the anxiousness, holding on to the struggle by ourselves. Or we can present it to God and ask God to come in and take over where our anxieties lie. This is why scripture tells us to be anxious for nothing. 
but in everything. By prayer and supplication. To present what we're facing, what we're asking to God. I don't know what you're walking through right now. I know what some of you are walking through, and Amy Lynn, we're praying for you. But I don't know what every single one of you are walking through right now. But I know this. God does. And I know this. You don't have to walk through life alone. This isn't something we come to do once a week. This is something we are. We are a community of people who follow Jesus, which means nobody who walks in these doors goes through life alone. And if you choose to, that's your choice. That's your choice. But know that there is an army of people that is ready and willing to walk beside you and pray beside you and carry you when you're too tired. But you've got to let us know. My hope and my prayer is that when you're walking through things like Hannah was, that you're not having to go to the temple alone. There's you people right beside you. That's what we're about here. Without apology. And so if you're facing it alone, then it's either pride or it's fear. It's one of the two. And either one's just going to lead you to a bad place. So don't walk through life alone. You don't have to. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Eli reminds Hannah, God's got this. God's got this. And I want to remind you today, God's got you. God's got you. That doesn't mean, again, it's going to be a fairy tale. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. It doesn't mean you're going to get everything you ever wanted. But nothing in your circumstances, nothing in your situation catches God by surprise. And God's got you. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. And they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her, and in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And sometimes in God's perfect timing, he gives us what we desire. Sometimes in God's perfect timing, he gives us what we desire. And for Hannah, that was a son. A son named Samuel. A son that God would do incredible things through. So the question is, with what you're facing, with what you're experiencing, are you asking God? Have you given Him your anxiety? Have you given Him your fear? Are you choosing to walk through life alone? Are you allowing people to come beside you and to help you and to pray with you and to walk through life with you? And just know, sometimes not in our timetable, but sometimes in God's perfect timing, He shows up and He blows our minds. And he gives us what we desire. And know this. That sometimes in God's perfect plan. He chooses not to. I wish every story ended this way. But it doesn't. 
as some families who struggle with infertility will tell you, their prayer is never answered. The miracle that they ask for, their Samuel, never comes. Does it mean that God isn't good? No. So what's the answer and why is the reason? Truthfully, I don't know. Because if I were God, I would answer every prayer that way. But this is the difficulty. I'm not. And that leaves me with a choice. And the choice is how will I respond? And for many, when they call on God and He doesn't answer a prayer in the way they want, especially regarding an illness or a sickness of of themselves or a loved one, that's the end. And they walk away. What I'm left with is the problem that God is bigger than me. And sometimes there are things that God wants to do in my life and the lives of others that I don't understand at the time. Sometimes years back, looking back, I see exactly what God was doing. And those are the stories that I love. Those are the stories that are so much fun. And honestly, those are the stories that I'd love to stand up here and share with you because they're exciting and it's encouraging and it's fun. But we're real and we're authentic. So I just got to tell you, there's some stories that I just shake my head. And say, I wish that ended differently. Because God didn't act there like I'd want him to. And if you're there, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of despair, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of hurt, in the midst of frustration. I want you to know that even though your life isn't a fairy tale, and even though you haven't gotten everything you wanted, God still loves you more than you can ever know. But practically, knowing that, I know is very hard to disconnect from the feeling. And so I want to offer you an invitation that you never have to walk through that despair and that discouragement alone. That we are here to walk with you, not just in the times we celebrate, but in the times we shake our heads and say, we don't know. God is bigger. Life is a struggle. And sometimes God intervenes in ways we want, and sometimes He doesn't. But it doesn't change who God is, it doesn't change His love for you. And we're allowed to be excited. And we're allowed to be disappointed. We are real. We are authentic. And we want to walk every step of the way through life together. That's what this community is all about. God, I pray that you would help us. I pray that no person who chooses to walk in these doors will feel like they have to walk through life alone. 
I pray that you'd help us in the times when you bless us and you answer our prayers in the way we want. Help us remember and thank you. And I pray, God, in the times you don't, to help us persevere. And to help us lean on each other. Help us be honest about our discouragement and about our despair. And to help us know in the heart of hearts that while we don't like what you're doing or we don't understand it or we don't agree with it, that you've got a plan. Pray for the person right now, God, who's in the midst of that despair, in the midst of that discouragement. And I just pray, God, that you would use us at Lakeside to encourage them. To help them. I pray that nobody feels like they have to walk through life alone. And we together would point one another to you. And journey to become more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray.